Good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Jonathan Munoz Pru, and I'm the Director of Cultural Programming here at A Noise Within. I am thrilled to welcome you this evening to the Alice in Wonderland virtual deep dive into the play. And I hope you all join us to see Alice in Wonderland opening this week, May 27th. So this evening, we are uh, gathering together with some incredible artists, creatives uh, uh, on the project. I want to welcome to the virtual stage, Miranda Johnson Haddad, a Noise Within's resident Shakespeare expert, and today talking with us about Lewis Carroll. Frederica Nascimento, our scenic designer and a resident artist. Ken Booth, the lighting designer and a resident artist. And Andresa Kaur, our director of photography. Welcome, and thank you all for joining us today. So I want to share with our audience sort of the structure, the format of the conversation today. Uh, we're going to spend about 45 minutes together. Um, each of our panelists will talk with you about 10-ish minutes about their role on the project. We would love to hear your questions throughout the conversation this evening. So feel free to paste your question in the chat feature on YouTube, and we'll see that on our end, and we'll answer them as we receive them throughout the evening. But to begin, to get us all sort of on the same page and wet our palettes, if you will, for this incredible production, we're going to start by sharing with you the Alice in Wonderland trailer for the virtual production. Enjoy. Oh, it seems very pretty, but it's rather hard to understand. It seems to fill my head with ideas. ideas. Wonderful, wonderful. I cannot wait for the opening this week. Um, and I can't wait to hear what you all have to share with us about this show. So first, we're going to kick off the evening by inviting Miranda uh, to share with us some context and history about the story. Hi. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here tonight. So I'm going to give us a little bit of an introduction to uh, the man we know as Lewis Carroll and the worlds that he created, Alice in Wonderland and the sequel Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there. So Lewis Carroll was born Charles Lutwidge Dodgson in 1832. He died in 1898 at the age of 66. So he is situated really quite squarely within the, the Victorian era. Queen Victoria actually came to the throne when he was five and outlived him by, by a few years and died in 1901. And I'll circle back to that a little bit later. Uh, he was one of 11 children. He was number three. He was the first son. It sounds as though his was truly an idyllic childhood. Uh, he grew up outside of, of Liverpool and then the family moved to Yorkshire. Um, his father was, was a parson. His mother was the parson's first cousin. And he seems to have been a just a very, um, very loved, nurtured child. And he also was recognized quite early on as having a, a marvelous imagination and, and really um, remarkable gifts. Um, I'm going to share with you now a, a quotation by one of his first biographers, who is actually one of his nephews. And he writes that uh, as a child, Dodgson invented the strangest diversions for himself, made pets of the most odd and unlikely animals, and numbered certain snails and toads among his intimate friends. <laughs> and I just love that. I think it, it really um, shows us who he was and that he was who he was, the imaginative qualities we see in the Alice books, the playful qualities, um, and the ability to just create, create worlds um, as a child that we also follow right through to, uh, to the Alice books. Um, he he excelled academically. Um, he he went to Oxford when he was about twenty years old and studied mathematics there. He actually came up with the pen name Lewis Carroll. 
when he first published in, in about 1856 or so, he published a, a poem and he wanted to publish under a different name than his professional name under which he'd already published various mathematical treatises. So he didn't want people to, um, to get confused. Um, and he came up with the name Lewis Carroll by taking his, his this shows his playfulness, I think too, as well as his, um, his knowledge and his erudition. He took his first name and his middle name, so Charles Lutwidge. He translated them into, uh, into Latin, <clears throat> so Carolus Ludovicus. Then he translated those back into, uh, back into, um, English, Lewis, uh, so so Carol Lewis, and then and then switched them and came up with Lewis Carroll. That was actually one of four pen names that he that he came up with, and his editor chose Lewis Carroll as as the best, and that's certainly the one we we know him best by uh, today. Though he did, as I say, have all these mathematical treatises. He was also an accomplished photographer, so really a an exceptional um, exceptional individual. Can I have the first slide, please? Um, there we go. Thank you so much. So this is this is the young Lewis Carroll, or as he was then, Charles Dodgson, around the time he matriculated at Oxford. So he's about 20 or 22 in this photograph. Um, very, very much showing the, the Victorian sensibility. I think he's he's looking, he's reading a book. Um, he's sensitive, but he's also seemingly outdoors, the love of nature. There's a great deal we can we can see about him as well as uh, learn about the time in this photograph. Okay, thanks. Um, we can deliver. Thank you. Um, so he he attended Christ Church College, which was also his his father's college at Oxford. And a, a momentous event occurred in about 1856 when a new dean came to Christ Church, and that was Henry Little. And he arrived there with his wife and his three daughters, and they were Lorena and Alice and Edith. And could I have the next slide, please? And here they here they are. That is Alice standing on the far right, um, and Edith on the far left. She was the youngest, and Lorena is is the oldest. This may, in fact, be a photograph that that Lewis Carroll himself took. There there are many wonderful photos of of Alice that also um, really really capture her spirit, and I'll I'll circle back to that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the the tradition has it, and it's pretty well established that the the stories that comprise the books we now know as Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass were were originally told one day when Lewis Carroll and another Oxford Don, another Oxford professor, were rowing the three little daughters down the Thames. And uh, they asked Lewis Carroll for a story. Um, they already knew his his storytelling abilities. He he was really a, a like an uncle to the girls and and very much part of the family circle. Um, so he began to tell the story of Alice's adventures underground, and uh, Alice herself, as she said later, as an adult, pestered him so much to to write the stories down that he he eventually did so. Um, made her a Christmas present of a beautifully hand uh, handwritten manuscript that he illustrated himself with the early earliest version of the book we now know as Alice in Wonderland. And I really love this this story uh, that the the Alice books began as um, as all good stories do as as part of an oral tradition, you know, as we as we as we see in Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey, as we see in so many wonderful, um, wonderful folk tales and and tales from from all ages and from from all over the world. Um, so so they the, these stories too began as 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 oral tales that were that were told. Um, Alice was very happy with her her manuscript, uh, and and I think Lewis Carroll would probably have left it at that. But then he was in turn very very much encouraged by his friend and another author, another children's author named George MacDonald, uh, who wrote equally wonderful books. They're not nearly as well known anymore as the as the Lewis Carroll books, but At the Back of the North Wind, The Princess and the Goblin, these are wonderful children's fantasy novels as well. And MacDonald urged him to, to, uh, to publish the book formally. And so Lewis Carroll uh, did. And, and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland um, was, was published in, uh, in 1865. And then Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there was published several years later in 1872. The books have never been out of print since. 
and uh, and they've been translated into over over 80 languages. And I think that their enduring popularity really owes a lot, not just to the to the worlds that Lewis Carroll created, but, but to that character of Alice in particular. And I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll circle back to her um, at the at the end of my my remarks. Um, both worlds are eventually revealed uh, to be a dream. Um, Alice wakes up um, at the end of Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass. Um, the, the central um, metaphor, if you will, of Alice in Wonderland is, is playing cards, a, a deck of playing cards, and the characters derive to a certain extent from, from the, the, the figures in the deck of cards. Um, the central metaphor through the looking glass is a chess game. And again, the characters derive from the, the, the chess pieces. Um, and both books, I think, really reflect what, for, for lack of a better term, we can call um, a Victorian sensibility in, in the best sense of what that means. Um, they, they certainly focus on, on the perceived innocence of childhood, but without the, um, the sort of cloying or saccharine um, qualities that sadly can characterize some Victorian literature and Victorian portrayals of, of children in particular. Many of the, of the nonsense poems in Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass are in fact satires of, um, of poems that uh, Lewis Carroll's readers would have known in some cases all too well. They were very um, sort of preachy poems, you know, instructing the young in, in how to behave in this kind of thing. And and the both the satire and the the um, the nonsense quality um, that that Lewis Carroll um, brings to them is is really very very appealing and there's a playfulness about it too which I think really really characterizes the poems and and the worlds that we see in Alice as well. Um, there are there are many personal touches too. In Alice. One of the most famous, um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, the one of the most famous is the character of of the dodo. This is uh, this is of course one of the wonderful illustrations by John Tenniel, who who did the illustrations for the original edition, published edition of Alice. And uh, several biographers of Lewis Carroll believe that the dodo was modeled on himself. Um, was modeled on himself. The reason is that uh, Lewis Carroll is said to have had a, a very, very slight stammer when he became nervous. And, and when he would introduce himself, Charles Dodgson, he would sometimes stammer slightly over his last name, as in da, da, Dodgson. So the, the um, many biographers have, have, uh, have surmised that the dodo is, um, is in fact modeled on, um, on, on Dodgson himself. Uh, thank you for the slide. We can go back. Thank you. Um, so, so many personal touches like that, and and certainly nowhere um, nowhere more so than in the in the character of Alice herself. And I think Alice really is the the main reason for the enduring appeal of the of the novels and of the um, of these worlds. Um, they are they are strikingly original. Nothing like them had ever been written before, or I would suggest since. Um, they they are playful, as I said. They are unsettling, but without being too frightening. Um, Alice herself sometimes feels timid. Sometimes she feels frightened. But in the end, she is a plucky heroine. I, I think, in some ways, the original plucky girl heroine. Um, and and it's it's that sort of delicate balance um, for me, at least, of 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 originality, of playfulness, of slightly edgy edgy episodes and characters um, that that really uh, accounts to a great extent for to the uh, for the appeal and the enduring appeal of of the books. Um, they have been, as I say, enormously popular, never out of print. Uh, they they permeate popular culture in ways that we sometimes don't even don't even realize. Um, uh, certainly in in uh, <laughs> in Southern California, I, I cannot neglect to mention Walt Disney and and the the 1951 animated version of Alice um, or the ride at Disneyland, one of the original rides. Um, fun fact, by the way, Walt Disney originally and his, his some of his colleagues reached out to wait for it, Aldous Huxley to write the screenplay of an Alice movie. Yes, I'll repeat that because I couldn't believe it either. Aldous Huxley, as in Brave New World, um, he 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 wrote a screenplay. Um, 
sadly, much of it was destroyed, but we do have some pages uh, remaining. We also have a 14 page synopsis um, of the of the the movie that he um, proposed Walt Disney purportedly did not like it. He said he could only understand at one in out of three words at best. And and Mr. Huxley did not end up writing um, the the movie that we now know as Alice in Wonderland. But um, it it goes you know it goes to show how um, I think what what a cultural status the the books had by then that someone of Huxley's reputation and caliber could be tapped by Walt Disney for this for this project. Really really pretty extraordinary. Um, Dream Child was a movie from 1985 that that what we would call it now a biopic. Ian Holm um, plays uh, plays Lewis Carroll. It's a it's a lovely film. Tim Burton famously <laughs> remade the movies for better or worse in 2010 and 2016. They played to mixed reviews, but um, <clears throat> the fact that he he got green lighted for both projects is. Is significant um, as a Matrix fan. I just have to mention in the 1999 film The Matrix, Keanu Reeves's character of Neo is told to follow the White Rabbit, and shortly thereafter sees a a White Rabbit tattoo on a young woman's arm and follows her down the rabbit hole. <laughs> so so really uh, just constant constant allusions, um, reimaginings, reconfigurings of of the uh, of the Alice worlds. Um, and I want to want to just conclude by by just um, really giving a, a shout out to Alice herself, who, as I say, is in many ways um, the original plucky heroine. Um, I personally can't ever remember not not knowing the Alice books before I was old enough to read them myself. My parents read them to me. And there was something really wonderful about Alice, who is who is smart, who is brave, who gets scared, but who at the end of the day sees through artifice both books end with her sort of calling calling it as she sees it. You're nothing but a pack of cards, she says to the playing cards at the end of Alice in Wonderland. Uh, through the Looking Glass, the book ends with her shaking the the, the Red Queen chess piece um, back into, into the kitten, into Dinah. Um, and I want to close with one of my favorite images. Last slide, please. <clears throat> so <laughs> this again is Tenniel. This is this is Alice confronting the Red Queen. Um, uh, the Red Queen saying, off with her head, Alice here is holding her ground and and not at all, not at all intimidated. And uh, and I'm reminded, thank you, we can we can go back. Um, I'm reminded uh, in this image of um, the uh, the statue of a fierce girl. Maybe some people remember this about four or five years ago. A, a statue of a fierce girl um, was was erected outside the 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 bull on uh, Wall Street. Anybody remember this? The the fierce girl sort of sta right standing there and you know just facing down the charging bull and. Uh, and and both of those, you know, the Tenniel image and 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 that fierce girl statue remind me of each other. And I really, um, I think Alice was was the first best plucky girl heroine, not saccharine, not sickly sweet, you know, brave and smart and and fierce. Um, and I just couldn't be couldn't be happier to see the the dramatic um, rendition of Alice coming to to a noise within right now. So thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Miranda. This is just a joy to hear all this. I love seeing the Tenniel images, the sketch. I mean, they're gorgeous. And as I hear you talk, I, I'm reminded of everything in my life in popular culture that is inspired by Alice Wonderland. I, I, I forget how it is everywhere in popular culture. So it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary, the endurance that iconography and, and language has. Uh, it, Exactly. Ken is, is was just reminding us going down the rabbit hole. You know, we all say that all the time lately, going down the rabbit hole of Wikipedia or YouTube or whatever it is. You know, it's 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 everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're going to shift now to Frederica, who's our extraordinary scenic designer, and will talk with us about the set. And uh, I'm excited for all of you watching because we're going to shift into seeing a lot of gorgeous images of design soon. Uh, Frederica, I wonder if you can first talk about the stools in the play. And for those of you who haven't seen the production yet, stools are a, 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 a quite a simple, a, though re repetitive bit of iconography that morph and transform and are used throughout the production. So Frederica, I'd love to learn, how did you land at this idea? Well, 
Uh, we started, uh, as Miranda so well uh, described and, and told us the story of Lewis Carroll work and life, which is so rich. We started reading about, that was like the beginning of our work uh, and we couldn't stop reading about Lewis Carroll um, work. And uh, we were looking into uh, Daniel's illustrations, of course, they were very inspiring. And there, there's one specific uh, illustration that uh, I, I will share with, with all of you. And, um, and all of us, which is this one that gave us the, the idea of using uh, frames that actually led us to the cover of a vintage, gorgeous book um, that we start using uh, as the proscenium arch, the gold proscenium arch that rotated into the thrust and in a red fashion uh that uh, was actually embracing those tools so those little hearts that you see on that uh, book cover it kind of started the the red game uh, uh that uh, stephanie schroyer the director of this uh, incredible show um uh, we were starting playing with it and uh and the stools connected us to the mushroom and there was like all this world around these little dots that had to be put in order on the thrust, around the thrust. And we were just playing around uh, with it. And uh, the most fascinating thing was when uh, Alice, that scene that creates the, um, the pool of tears, and how we would resolve that, the stools were fundamental and that game with all the characters. So it really became probably like as a, con a concept, like one of the key elements of the whole uh, scenic design. Um, going back to that book and the, the proscenium arch frame um, and going back to Tanil's illustration, it's, it's really difficult not to get um, completely lost into this fascinating world. And uh, there was one illustration that I, I brought with me today that was also key into this design that was the chess game. And we were trying to play with that um, and uh, understanding how we could bring the chess game into the scenic design and, uh, and that became also a key element for us for rotation. Uh, when we, we see the play, we know that uh, when um, Alice goes uh, to Wonderland through the, the looking glass, um, we have that um, Victorian fireplace that you know, just transforms itself in this red imaginary world. And so we are just playing around with all of these um, scenic ideas, these key elements. Um, and then of course, um, soon enough, um, Ken Booth join us um, because when I design, I really incorporate lighting into my sets and Ken was like key element. And he just joined us in this adventure into the rabbit hole um, and it was really fascinating because then we start creating spaces also. And Ken, I'm sure he's going to mention that and talk about it. Um, we start just creating this um, world um, of bringing together the, um, these red elements. What started happening was um, I started to think about there was... Um, Probably the most challenging part of this um, design was we were dealing with the prologue that introduces that Victorian dreamy land, right? That Miranda so well uh, talked about. And, um, and then um, the key thing for the beginning of the storytelling was to create these doors, these magic doors that grow and sh you know shrink and how would you do that, right? And so we started 
using um, these um, drops, uh, these three-dimensional red drops to create uh, that uh, world of the, the shrinking possibilities of an entrance or an exit to Alice. And, and so we were playing with that. Uh, and we were creating some magic tricks, like the, the table when she, she tries also to reach out for the key. And do you remember that part? Like um, we were working with Erin uh, Wally, she's an amazing prop master. Um, and uh, we figured it out uh, to do uh, like uh, a sort of a hat table. So one of the actors uh, could kind of shrink the table, you know, standing and, and not standing. And so we, we're literally having a lot of fun with, with, with Alice in Wonderland. Um, the, the key thing for me uh, with my uh, collaboration was um, the, uh, the openness and the really want to discover new things that our director uh, and uh, later on when we were tacking uh, Julia Rodriguez Elliott, she joined us also to create and help because it was so much. We were creating um, the prologue plus 20 scenes, super paced, like nonstop, because we wanted to keep the, the show uh, very fluid uh, without interruption. And so um, it was really sort of a effort, uh, a collaboration with, with everyone uh, to, to really make it happen. So, uh, and uh, of course I need to say that when uh, I saw um, Set to Go was the, our shop and the noise within, uh, I have to give a shout out to Kathy Lee. She was amazing. I mean, that floor that she painted was really, gorgeous, I couldn't ask for more. She just did exactly what we were hoping for. And um, and of course, Angela Kailan, I can't forget, she just brought life into that world also. Um, and, um, and it was really, really fascinating to see during tech, like everything coming together. Uh, when and of course, we Angela is our creating. costume designer. For those who don't know, Angela designed costumes and isn't. Okay. Hey, Frederica, our could I, hey, Frederica, could I interrupt? I just want to say, yeah. um, I just want to say, I, I, it was very challenging to create all these different places that Alice travels across through um, with essentially a dozen moving pieces, whether they're pieces on, I mean, on wheels, rolling in and out. Um, the vertical and horizontal flats that are flown in and out. Um, the, you know, it sounds simple, but it, I mean, we had to, it had to happen really fast during the, the show that we presented to the audience. Um, and of course it involved a, a few people backstage on line sets, um, uh, you know, uh, bringing out or bringing in, um, you know, flats, vertical and horizontal to create all these different places. And uh, anyway, it was it was quite a challenge to, to do that. It, yeah. it was, it was, and a fun one, a fun one. I, I always ask for the moon and I get it, at the noise within. So um, it was, it was really like, um, and I know uh, Ken Booth, uh, we were, uh, Ken, you were designing uh, Winter's Tale at the time, so it was in repertory. Um, so that also helped, uh, I believe, to kind of um, bring um, as much line sets and, and light uh, into it, right? Well, uh, Winter's Tale and Alice are so similar in, in plot, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, so we really. were also, oh. you know, uh, playing with that because uh, as uh, we all know, we we have uh, a repertory theater company, and so that is really a challenge for all of us uh, when we are uh, thinking about how can we make, in this case, the magic happen, right? Yeah. How can we do it? Because it really takes a lot of thinking, and um, and so it just uh, I I was thrilled when we start teching 
it was uh, it was it was challenging, as Ken says. Uh, but at the same time, we were still discovering um, a lot of things with choreography and and of course with Ken uh, lighting it. It was just uh, there was these stripes on the floor that um, they existed before in two towers that were not uh were not built cut um, for budgetary reasons exactly but uh i got them i got them because ken gave them to me with with his light so i was i was very lucky to to have them and it, I, everything i did have some chessboard patterns on the floor as well but i don't think we have any photos of them they mostly happen in act two especially when whenever the um, chess board rotates to um, uh, signal a, a transition, scene change. So I would I would throw in a little effect of, um, and we don't, there, I don't think we have any photos of that, but mm -hmm. um, I would throw in a little effect of, um, of uh, lighting patterns of chess boards mm -hmm. rotating on the stage as well. I remember that, Ken, it sort of, for me, uh, shatters and expands the chessboard to sort of fill yeah. the space. It's, yes, it's it, it, was, it was really beautiful. And uh, I, I haven't seen uh, the, this, what was filmed, uh, this production. So I, I'm looking forward to the opening uh, tomorrow. Uh, yes. I'll be there for sure. Well, two days, I'm, I'm really Thursday. Busy. Thursday. So I'm, we'll I'm see you there, and Frederica. I just want to say, uh, and to everyone, for me, this production because there's so much momentum and movement and expanding of scenery and pivoting of scenery. I just feel like the whole play is this beautiful gold antique uh, pocket watch that's just sort of ticking away in all these directions. It's just um, in constant motion in a really. It appears simple to us watching. But it's so obvious to those of us in this Zoom call that it's far from simple to pull that off. So Federica, and one more thing I'll say about this is I love this design of yours from the moment I saw it. It's absolutely stunning. Thank but you. it wasn't until this week when I saw the cover of the book, if we could bring the book back, that it all just clicked on a perfect level because everything you're painting with, the palette, the shapes, the iconography, is in this book. Even the trees sort of seem to echo and mirror the foliage uh, in this yes. book. So congrats yeah. to you. It's it's extremely uh, elegant and sophisticated. And now we're gonna shift to Ken and he's gonna uh, fill out this conversation with uh, lighting design. And specifically, Ken, I wanna start by telling our audience a little bit about how your work as lighting designer was different this time around working on the filmed production as opposed to the stage production. And I'll start by saying that the design, including the lighting design, was not designed specifically for the film production. It was a stage design that then we filmed and tweaked and edited. But tell us a bit about your process there. Well, um, yeah, I, I think if I was to light it specifically for film, I'd probably be using less lights in a way because even though, uh, yes, it was a recreation and you have lights coming from so many directions, but for film, I think you don't need as much. I would, I would, you you could get away with much more one directional lights, even though it's multi camera. Um, you know, we have such a unique stage to begin with. Um, because you, it does offer different uh, opportunities for camera placement. But that being said, um, the scenery is still in a proscenium form. So like in this picture, you can see um, this is a camera left shooting uh, to audience right. And that's where the audience is usually, usually sitting. So for the stage, I'm, I'm, I'm designing as if there were audiences sitting around the thrust stage, but for film, I would, you know, uh, design for the specific camera frame. And uh, even though we have wide shots um, and uh, we have, a, but we have a lot of close-ups as well. So I think, I think for film, I mean, I think my role in a way for filming would be closest to that of uh, as a, a gaffer as opposed to a lighting designer because um, as a, a gaffer, I, I'm maybe lighting the set, the scene, but um, the cinematographer is gonna say, well, 
I need less light here or I need more light here. And with Andressa, I had to adjust the lighting levels quite a bit. I had to take them down a lot because for theater, it's much more contrasty. I, I tend to like to have the front lighting very low and the back lighting very hot. To me, it's just much more dramatic and theatrical. But for film, that doesn't really translate so well. It just looks too harsh. Um, it looks too blown out. So, so I did have to maybe bring up the front, night, front lighting a little bit and the back lighting down. And also because we were almost shooting 360, um, we had four cameras. I did where, where the audience usually would be. I hung a lot of bulbs or you know little light fixtures all around just in case the camera would pick up um, some of that instead of just there being a black void uh, behind, you know, behind the actors. I, you know, a lot of the photographs we have tonight are from the stage production. So there's, it's a little bit different, but I, I know these beautiful, uh, uh, red orbs or bulbs that you're talking about, Ken, that are just sort of floating in the empty audience and provide a, a nice atmosphere and architecture, uh, when, when you see off the stage. Ken, can you tell us a little bit about, um, your relationship to color and your use of color in this in this production? Well, for this production, it's very a limited palette, really, because you it's just it's red, golds, tans, and even black. And you know, black's not in the set, but black is off the set. I mean, up especially when you turn off a lot of lights and you try to create isolated moments, so you see a lot of you know black um, upstage. Correct and. Um, so even though normally, I mean, I like, I love using the color red. I think a lot of times red might be more associated with something, um, something violent or something passionate. But in this case, um, it was, that's the color of the set. And uh, it was very easy to light the set with, with red. Also the floor, the floor is always, always important to me. Um, it was a very easy floor to light with texture. Hmm. So uh, colors, as far as color, you know, this set didn't lend itself to just any color. I mean, the blue showed up, especially if we did have atmosphere or haze um, going, you know, in, in the air. But, but um, otherwise, you know, using the lavenders or even greens or blues, don't show up as well uh, on a set with a lot of red and, and warm color. Even though I, I love using teal and there's some shots where there's teal, but that's, we see it because we have atmosphere, but otherwise in general um, using teal on a, on a set that's limited to, to, um, to, to go amber tan or red um, is not always complimentary. Thank you so much, Ken. You know, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. And so right. we'll shift now to um, talk briefly about costumes, though Angela is not with us today. In just a moment, we'll show a, a few of uh, her uh, sketches. And then we'll shift to Andresa, who will tell us about filming and how COVID has impacted that. Um, you know what, let's go to costumes now. Uh, first, we have an Alice costume or an Alice sketch rather. And you can see the work Angela did to prepare. There's certainly the iconic um, blue dress, white apron. And having spoken with Angela and the design team, um, it was clear that there was a real desire to honor the iconography of this classic story and, and maintain those pieces that people love, but also to expand it into something that was uh, Angela's creation. So you can see how Alice's uh, wardrobe looked uh, in the production. You can also see the um, the is it the uh, the caucus race. This group of creatures around her, um, birds, crabs, um, all sorts of layers of, of fabrics and feathers and textures. And um, Angela was really going for a a quirky, uh, fantastical world here. Now we're going to go to some sketches of the king. 
And the queen, you can see how the design begins. And then we'll show in comparison what they looked like in the production. And then we'll share the Mad Hatter and the Mad Hair. And there's the Mad Hair, or the March Hair rather. And then we'll see them in production. I just wanna point out too, uh, you see the beautiful blacks and golds and uh, this great pattern that repeats throughout all the design. And finally, I just wanna acknowledge the Victorian ensemble. So Stephanie, our, our extraordinary director uh, with Angela decided that the base of this ensemble that would be transforming from character to character to character for about an hour and a half, um, everyone plays multiple characters except Alice their base would be this white palette, this Victorian uh, wardrobe, and they would remove pieces, put on pieces, and transform into the creatures of Wonderland. Um, so with that abbreviated uh, introduction to costume, we're gonna now shift to Andresa, our director of photography. Um, so take it away, Andresa. I'm gonna bounce off video for a moment to plug in my computer, but I am right here. <laughs> And Andresa, if you could tell us first about the um, uh, unique uh, opportunities that were allowed in this uh, with uh, 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 the different shots, please. Yeah, so we shot this in the course of two days. It was a Saturday and a Sunday. And we didn't shoot it in order. We were shooting in the, preferring the, the camera angles. But the filming of the play uh, allow us to explore different camera angles. So we were shooting, uh, for example, an overhead shot that we put the camera on top of like a 12 step ladder. And we could also put the camera, that that's an angle that the audience doesn't really get usually. We put the camera uh, upstage, downstage, sorry, close to the, to the wings. And that was a, a perspective that they usually don't get to see. So filming the play allow us to, to bring those different camera angles and play with it and get closer to the actors. So that was very interesting for us. Um, we also, we couldn't get to you. So those are more overhead um, angles that we were able to explore. We couldn't use the, you couldn't use smoke because of COVID restrictions. And Ken and I were very sad about it, but we, uh, we added a filter, it's called smoke filter from Tiffin. And that was used exactly to try to bring a little bit of ambient because I feel Alice, both Ken and I feel that Alice is, is so atmospheric and we were really missing the, the smoke on it. So that's one of the solutions that we got to add. Uh, because of COVID restrictions. Uh, for the social distance, that was a major part of our preparation. Julie and I went on and mapped the whole blocking of the actors based on the archival that we had. And, and then we went on and we thought some of the blocking to make sure that they were all safe. I, I feel we have, um, we've, yeah, we have the map. So, this is the overture uh, before COVID. They were all clustering together uh, at the edge of the, um, the stage. And then after that, with the reblock, which I thought it was very charming, actually, they were outlining the shape of the boat. And with that, Julia was able to find a solution that it was beautiful visually and also uh complying with the new guidelines and everybody was feeling safe. I think we have another one as well. The white knight had way more um, blocking before. And I think now uh, Bert and Eric have brought a lot of the dynamic of it from their interaction while still being safe uh, six feet away from each other. And I think the last one is the, yeah, the Matt Tea Party was, I think it was the, the biggest change that we had. It, it changed the whole diagram of everything for, for the social distancing. So that was one of the things that we kept uh, pre preparing the most during our, our rehearsals and everything because 
Um, I'm sorry, uh, because uh, I mean, everybody needed to be safe. We needed to implement the guidelines, and yeah, that was that was a big part of of the um, of the preparation. We also had a lot of things that we could add because we were filming. Uh, one of the things is because we shot in in the course of two days, and we had more time in between the the scenes, so we could add makeup. They could. Uh, put on makeup and we could add there there are more actors on the mushroom scene as well because now they had time to change the costume something that they didn't have before and I, the the best ad it was mo most charming one uh we could add gachita as the kitty uh let's see we had a stuffed animal as kitty but this time around we have a real cat her name is gachita and she's very charming. So I think that was like one of the highlights. It was very nice to be on set with her. Uh, yeah, but there were many possibilities with the filming uh, version of it. And I really hope everybody likes it. I hope the kids like it too. I feel like a lot of kids will be seeing this. So I really hope they like it. It's an incredibly magical experience, even through a screen. I think a lot of it really came through and, you know, kudos to your great work, Andresa. And um, I want to acknowledge for folks who didn't see the original, the live on stage production, this is a play that involves a lot of um, uh, closeness and dancing and jumping and hugging. And the, the ensemble is moving all around each other. So I can't even imagine the amount of work it took to translate that closeness into something that was uh, physically distant and safe. Um, we have, uh, I think, a really cute video of the cat uh, that was cast in the video uh, filming of the show. We'd love to share that with all of you. We'll pull that up in just a moment. Kitty dear, can you play chess? Because when we were playing just now, you watched as if you understood it. And when I said check, you purred. Well, really, it was a nice check, Kitty, and I might have won if it hadn't been for that nasty knight that came wriggling down among my pieces. <gasps> Kitty, let's pretend that you're the Red Queen. You know, I think if you sat up and folded your arms, you'd look exactly like her. Now, do try, there's a dear. No, you're not holding your arms properly. <clears throat> I'll just hold you up to the looking glass and you can see how sulky you are. And if you're not good directly, I'll put you through into Looking Glass House. How would you like that? I love that. I love that so much. It's so fun. Um, it's such a great scene. It really added uh, so much life, literally, to that scene. Um, so another thing I want to share before we come to an ending in just a, a couple moments is uh, I'd love to show, in the spirit of describing this physical distancing, um, I'd love to show the Tweedledee original photograph where we see the closeness of these characters, um, the, the, the Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Uh, the Tweedles, if you will, uh, they're, they're sort of attached to the hip and they're always side by side, one arm around the other. And now I want to share one of my favorite videos, one of my favorite clips is uh, this, this hilarious and iconic Tweedledee uh, musical number. Enjoy. What shall we repeat to her? The walrus and the carpenter. That's the longest. If it's very long, would you tell me please which road I... The sun was shining on the sea. Shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and white. But this was odd because it was the middle of the night. Ha! The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They whiffed like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said it, it would, would be grand. grand. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us. The walrus did beseech a pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. So four young oysters hurried up, all eager for their treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And, and this was odd because, you know, they hadn't any feet. I enjoy that every time I watch it. I, I can't help but like tap my foot along with it. 
Uh, it's such fun. And I hope you can see they didn't touch once. It, the, the whole thing needed to be re-choreographed, re-blocked to include that, that uh, social or physical distancing. So with that, I can hardly believe it's been 50 minutes. So this just zoomed by for me. It's been such a treat to get to hear from all of you. Congrats and thank you for your, for your gift, for your work, for supporting uh, this production, which all of us at A Noise Within could not be prouder of. Um, and I hope that all of you watching uh, find time uh, to, to join us for the production that opens this Thursday and um, plays until June 20th. I also want to uh, uh, invite all of you to our 21-22 virtual season announcement tomorrow, Wednesday, May 26th at 5 p.m. I believe we're going to be chatting a link in, um, to the YouTube page and an RSVP link and a viewing link is also available on our website. Be the first to hear the uh, next A Noise Within season, which is going to be in real life, in person, in the theater, and if that wasn't glorious enough, it is our 30th anniversary season, which I have chills saying. It's a very special moment for all of us here at A Noise Within. Um, as I said, join us opening night, Thursday, May 27th for Alice in Wonderland. Catch it before it closes after June 20th. Um, and of course, all of this can be found on our website, anoisewithin.org. I wanna give a shout out to our amazing tech magician backstage, Annette Nixon, our new production manager. Thank you for all of your support. Thanks again to all of you who joined us from home and to our great panelists. Thanks all. We look forward to seeing you again in the theater soon. Be well and good night.